Thanks for having me. My name is Jeff Craveld. I'm a athletic trainer with Rebound Physical Therapy. I've also been with this group for about 10 years now, and I spend most of my time in the PT setting. I also cover <clears throat> a high school, but it's a small percentage of what I do throughout the week. So I get to work with majority of the throwers that come through Rebound, which is what I'm passionate about and love to do. Um, and we have a great location. I'm at the Pacific Crest location. There's four, we have four PT clinics and at our location we have about 8,000 square feet turf and this big space to throw. So it's kind of kind of where I love to live. I have no conflicts or interests. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do is, as a fellow ATC, I understand that you guys have you know, hundreds of athletes under your care. So you don't always get the opportunity that I do to follow these athletes through their you know, full rehab of the injury setting, post-surgical setting, and into like the return of throw and the return of sport. So I want to be able to give you guys a kind of a, an idea how we transition these athletes back to, the, to return to play. And I've put up here a few of the things that we talk to the parents and the athletes and really the coaches about. And this, all this data is out there for everybody. We just haven't, it seems that we're not really using the data that's available to us because we have kids that are throwing year round, even though all of the study research is that this is gonna lead to higher risk of injury and potentially surgeries. So number one risk factor in our youth elbow injuries are playing that single sport, that specialization. <clears throat> UCLA did a, a really nice <clears throat> study a few years back that talked about sports uh, specialization and even your elite professional athletes they didn't specialize in one sport until they were around you know the 16 to 17 year old age so getting our kids these young 8 9 10 year olds started and playing baseball year round doesn't make a lot of sense but it's what we keep doing our parents keep doing our coaches keep doing to these kids and this is why we're seeing this higher number of of youth elbow and shoulder injuries in the clinic setting Pitchers who competed eight months were five times the likely to suffer an injury. That's uh, we encourage to take the four months off, two to three sometimes is more reasonable for people. But in the Northwest, it's a we have a built-in uh, rest and recovery in the winter time, right? Like baseball isn't played in the winter, but we see places like Portland Baseball Club up in Vancouver. We have Northwest Futures. They have these massive indoor facilities. So these kids are playing year round. Well, what we're trying to do is en encourage and educate to play a different sport, to do something, let the body move in a different way in a pattern for a, a period of time. Um, other highlighted ones, uh, player pitchers, specifically over 100 innings in a calendar year, they're 3.5 times more likely. <clears throat> About, uh, I would say five to 10 years ago, we were saying 10 times your age, and that was the max innings. So if you're a 14-year-old, 140 innings was the max. Now with the more data coming through, 100 is the one that we're going to now. So um, you can see a huge change even over the last five, five, 10 years. And then there's the two to three month mark for the rest. A couple other studies that have been published out there, uh, consecutive day pitching, greater risk. Uh, the pitcher-catcher combo is a big one. When these little kids come into our clinic with their parents, we're telling them choose one or the other. The combination doesn't work. It's the two positions in baseball that throw the ball the most. So we try to get them in an early age and say, you're gonna be a pitcher, you wanna be a catcher, don't do them both. Uh, multiple teams, again, with all the showcases, all the club sports, like they're going year round. Anybody, if you collect all the data on these injured athletes, a lot of them play multiple teams and multiple teams at the same time. So you have coaches that don't talk to each other, don't communicate. They're just trying to win baseball games and you know, these kids are thinking they're gonna get recruited. Um, curveballs and sliders also, um, it's been a up and down kind of, you know, I went to an ASMI course 10 years ago that said actually no, throwing curveballs isn't bad, but now it's been bouncing back and forth. I think it all has to do with the repetition, right? Just that how, how frequently and how often they're throwing. That's what, what really it comes down to. <clears throat> so Helen did a great job of just recapping from the rehab 
side of things. So I'm just going to kind of just briefly go through with my throwers what I'm looking at when I'm, you know, Dr. McCarran sends them to us and we do our initial evaluation and what over the next, you know, time frame, six, 12 weeks that I'm going to be treating them, uh, what things we're going to stay on top of. So range of motion, talked about the total arc. Um, elbow extension, we got to remember that, especially with our post-ops, right? You got to make sure we're getting full because you'll have a kid come in with an elbow injury and uh, you look at both sides, you know, one's, you know, lacking 10, 15 degrees. So we got to work on maintaining that normal uh, passive and active range of motion through the elbow as well as the shoulder, as we know. Strength, we kind of hit on a few of the things we do in the clinic, upper and lower extremity. I add a lot of glute work into that, so while I'm doing all that band stuff, they're also got bands, you know, the lateral resistors around their ankles. They're doing a lot of the com uh, combined movements with a medicine ball. We're not just doing one plane, we're changing the planes. The step up to twist you saw, we're working on that rotation, dry, you know, generating force off the push-off leg and then rotating through the left hip, which is their plant leg for pitchers when they land, and for throwers, when they land, they're rotating through the left side. So we're just trying to get, build that strength and, and keep those muscles moving. It's a use it or lose it. If you don't use those muscles, they're just gonna sit there and not be effective for the thrower. So <clears throat> again, if we have a, a patient comes in, an athlete, a thrower, pitcher, um, we're gonna say, we're gonna shut them down for six weeks, okay? So they've had the injury, they've had an MRI, they've had an x-ray, six weeks of no throwing. And this is just kind of our standard, what we go by. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll fudge on that a little bit, just depending if I get a, a good history of the kid. If he does, if he's a, you know, a three sport guy and he did play um, you know, football, basketball, I might be a little you know, lenient on that, but that's kind of our general thing. Is six weeks of no throwing, we're building up our core strength, cuff, glutes, hips, everything, um, and then we'll do a six-week progression, throwing progression after that. And now I'll go through more of some examples of throwing progressions here later on. For me, the throwing mechanics is the number one thing. We can do all this work with these kids and these athletes in the clinic, in the rehab setting, and work hard and have them work hard on their home exercise programs. But if we don't address the, the mechanics, um, they're going to get back right to where they were back at the doctor's office. Because you can videotape these kids and, be, and see things on the video that says, well, no wonder his elbow hurts. You know, he's dropping down on the side. He's doing a milky maneuver to his UCL. The stress test we do to test the UCL, and that's where his pain is. So he's dropping his arm slot. He's upright in his throwing position. And I say, we got, if we don't fix that, we're going to be right back to where we were. So it's a simple, you know, most of the apps out there are free that you can use. I, I was a big fan of Huddle. Um, it has a great platform to where you can videotape the kid and send him through his app a voiceover recording of, hey, this is what you need to work on. Here's the mechanics. You can draw lines and use it. Um, it's a great effective way to get the communication back and forth to your athletes. Um, it's just an iPhone or an iPad that you use. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on the fancy equipment when you're just doing kind of quick throwing assessment, like throwing mechanic analysis. <clears throat> so some uh, considerations in when we are doing return to throwing. Towel drills, Helen had a slide of it. I don't know if you caught it, but it essentially all this is a, a wiffle ball in a pillowcase, and I have it just wrapped up. And even back in college, when, when pitchers, you know, when we were on the off, um, so the hitters and um, infielders, outfielders were taking fielding, we were just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, you know, coaches eventually started to say, well, we can work on our mechanics while stressing the arm by using a towel. So we'd go through hundreds and thousands of repetitions, and um, it was a great way to kind of train these mechanics. So this can be done early on, especially in your post-ops. Um, it's, not a, it's not a stress at all. That's the, the phenomenon of baseball is you have a 5.4 ounce ball that you put in the kid's hand or an athlete's hand and now there's this repetitive trauma and stress that happens. The towel isn't going to hurt them at all. Um, proper warm-ups. Uh, again, being in the Northwest, it's a little hard to get out and have our athletes 
properly warm up, get the blood flow going, get the muscles, turn the muscles on. I make sure that I try to um, emphasize running, getting the heart, heart going. Um, we have a lot of, as you guys all know, there's a lot of dynamic lower extremity warm-ups out there in your soccer, your uh, basketball, volleyball, but you don't see a lot of upper body. I'll give you an example of the one that I've used before, uh, just again to, to turn those muscles on, turn our stabilizers on, ask them to work for us when we're actually doing this stressful throwing motion. Bands, of course, again, scapula recruitment, cuff recruitment, and then some of the plyo ball drills you saw. I will have guys do that pre-throwing. So that will be a part of their pre-throwing routine. And these are, these are minimum reps. They're not like doing 100 of them. It's like 10 in each position, just to kind of, again, turn things on. Um, Warm-up throws. Again, especially at a young age, you tell, you have a coach who just tells the kids line up on the, on the line. They all just start playing catch, and the balls are going every, you know, all over, and they do 15, 20 minutes. I want it to be a very purposeful warm-up. You want to have them count their reps. You do 10 throws, 30 feet, 45, 60, 90, 120. 120 is the furthest what we have our athletes throw. And the research has backed it up. There's been um, a ton of analysis done at the ASMI with Dr. Fleissig, who took these athletes out on the field. And once they got past 120 feet, all the mechanics, you know, they failed. They started dropping the backside. They had to try to get the ball higher, dropping the elbow down, trunk angle collapses, lose all that stability that they have in their in their lower half and all the way up into their upper body. So 120 is where you go, um, is the maximum we throw. Um, and then throwing on a straight line kind of goes along with this. So we don't want them to put anything under the ball. You're not wanting them to like loop the ball up because there's then changing in mechanics. I want them to try to throw it and hit their partner in the chest. And if it bounces 10 times, it doesn't matter. That's the purpose behind it. Is they're trying to throw that ball on a straight line. <clears throat> Other considerations. <clears throat> we have to treat these pitchers, especially when you get to the collegiate level, you got to treat them um, by position. You don't want your, your closer in the beginning of a game, especially cold weather, going out, warming up, doing a ton of throws, getting the blood pumping, and then go sit down for two hours. And then coach calls the middle reliever who's Maybe he's been sitting in the outfield. Maybe he's still been sitting on the bench and say, hey, go warm up in the bullpen and throw 20 throws. That's not, that's not appropriate. That's, you're just going to ask them for more injuries. So you want to treat these guys um, by their position. The starters should do the proper warm up at the beginning of the game, into the bullpen, and then onto the mound to start the game. Those middle relievers and closers is hard in the high school and youth level just because you don't have the number of kids. You don't have POs, what we call them, pitchers only, like you do in college. But I've seen in the high school level um, over the last five, 10 years that POs are becoming a bigger thing in high school. We've got, on our team, we've got seven POs. They don't even play a position. They are pitcher only. So our coaches are, are treating them that way, and that's um, how we're keeping those guys healthy. Pitch count, we've done a great job at the youth level. Obviously, all the regulations out there. Uh, coaches can't get past this these days. And even in the high school, 10 years, well, even five years ago, there was no pitch count. But now in the last few years, we do have pitch count now in the high school, which is, is, is awesome. Days of rest in between, I'll show you a, a good resource for this stuff for all your aged athletes. Um, loss of IR, so also studies have shown over a calendar year or a season, but even one outing, Athletes, these pitchers specifically, can lose up to seven to ten degrees of internal rotation after a one outing. You know, it's usually going to be an 80 pitch or more, but you're talking about seven to ten degrees. That's a significant amount of loss in internal rotation. So the importance of arm care and keeping that range of motion, keeping them on their sleeper stretches, keeping them on their post cap, doing their the ball work in the back, the self trigger stuff, all that. Um, great stuff you guys do in the training rooms. They've got to keep it before and after they throw. And it's got to be daily. It's got to be a part of them taking care of their arms. Again, I hit on the no pitcher, uh, pitcher catcher. Um, and then don't throw with arm soreness. So most of the coaches will say, ah, it's just a part of the sport. And I, and I, and I understand that. Playing baseball, I, I remember my arm being sore. The problem is, is that I don't think they, 
especially the younger coaches and even the high school coaches don't understand um, exactly what soreness is. You know, if it's a bicep soreness that it's mid belly, like I'm okay with that. You know, the biceps job, as we saw in all the presentations, how it inserts up and it's involved with the labrum. I mean, its job is to literally pull the humerus back so it's not dislocating every time you do this massive movement. Um, so soreness in the muscle belly, okay, but soreness like in the shoulder and elbow, that can't be, we can't just say, yeah, just throw through it, warm, you know, get warmed up, see how it goes. We have to kind of really monitor what is pain and what soreness. Um, and then cool downs kind of already hit back on that. I uh, want them to do this stuff at the end of the game and at the end of their outings as well, just to kind of stay on top of joint health. So this was an example of uh, upper extremity dynamic warm-up. I can't really go through all these for you, but I can show you a few of them. Um, it takes about, <clears throat> if you do it at 10 reps each, I think it's, I've timed it about like seven, eight minutes. So it doesn't take a long time. But Going from the front here to 90-90 ERs to butterflies to goal posts, genies is another version of a, a post cap stretch, like a sleeper stretch. Then you interlock and push, so you're pulling here. You're doing rotational side to side, forwards, back. The whole time I'm pulling my fingers apart. And then you do the opposite where you're pushing, maintaining the push, rotating, elevating, back and forth. That's interlock push, interlock pull. The 90-90 box, you have a thumb up, and make a box out in front, you're pushing down, pushing down into it, hold, and you're pushing up, and then you're changing positions here, down, up, from the top, the bottom. It goes through a, a sequence there. Palm press prayer, similar. Finger press, you're going from each finger, I'm doing thumbs, pointers, middles, through, pinky. And then I add rotations to it, side to side movement. Um, same thing with the elbow side, and then press up in the prayers and rear presses. So you're pressing here, there. Sorry about this cold, it's my kid's fault. <clears throat> so here's into the uh, throwing program. So this is our throwing progression. The first one up here is an off season. So we want these kids to have this adequate rest, right? This time frame in the winter. But we don't want them showing up for first, you know, tryout, first, you know, spring ball practice, and now, now they haven't done anything. They haven't done anything to, you know, condition the arm. So this is just a nice, kind of basic. Doesn't even, I mean, you're ten throws at 30 feet and ten throws at 45. I mean, it's nothing. But it's just a nice, easy, slow progression, and because it's so simple, it can be done daily. And this is about a. This is like our four-week program that we'll give our, our throwers. This is one that's more geared for our post-ops. Okay? This is, um, here's the week. So this is the six-week progression. And then here's the days. So you see at the beginning, you have a day off. So you're throwing a Monday. Tuesday is rest day. We're doing rehab day. And then day three, you're throwing 10 more throws than the previous. And then you get to like a weekend, so the Friday, and then you have two days off. So you get two days off on the weekend. And then it just kind of progressed down. Once we get to through six weeks, we stop at 120. Remember that. And then we go through a six week. So for our pitchers, it's a six week like flat ground bullpen. So starting out all fastballs, and it's all based on intensity. So we're doing, you know, 20 throws in that bullpen for the first time, you know, 50, 50 to 70%. I've always been a, uh, I've always been kind of uh, anti radar gun with baseball athletes because I think what they're trying to do is just get the 90 right. Everybody wants to get, you know, get recruited. They're going to make the big money. You got to hit the number. Kids always talk about velo, velo, velo. Um, so I was always like, no, don't use radar guns. But the one thing I could say about radar gun is if you use it in the fashion of where you're trying to say, hey, I want you to throw. At 70%, because most of the kids, if you tell them that, they're going to throw 90 to 100. <laughs> I mean, 70 to them, they don't understand that. So if you have a radar gun to use, because most of them will be able to tell you, yeah, I topped off at you know, 89, you know, 87, then you can actually use that to say, okay, this is where I need to throw. This is the, you know, the exertion I need to put through my throw. And then, yeah, all the way to bullpen. 
Um, <clears throat> some of the newer devices out there that can help us in the uh, rehab setting, but also in your guys' setting. Um, if anybody's familiar with the Modus sleeve, this is the Modus Throw app. Um, they've developed a uh, sleeve that you can put an accelerometer in, and this is specific to the elbow, and it can measure shoulder external rotation, maximum shoulder edge. It can measure the rotational speed, so like RPMs, and then arm slot. So from where in that slot uh, they are. And they came out, they published their information, so it's not just guys just trying to sell another thing on the market. Um, they did find that uh, the three metrics combined, arm slot, arm speed, and arm rotation, have a significant relationship with the varus torque of the elbow. I know that, that kind of threw me off at first because we were always talk about valgus stress. Well, it's the valgus stress, but it's the varus torque that's trying to pull, pull back. Does that kind of make sense? Um, you have one newton meter increase in elbow varus torque was associated with 13 degrees drop in an arm slot. So if they're a three-quarter pitcher and they drop 13 degrees, that's how much increase in stress they had. And then with the 116 degrees of rotational arm speed, so we know that the faster the arm is going, the more stress the arm. It's kind of that, what Helen was saying. I mean, yeah, you need to be able to have speed and lots of extra rotation to throw in mid-90s, but it's also going to increase the stress. That's just, that's just what happens with the throwing shoulder. And then the eight, increase in, uh, eight degrees increase in arm rotation. So this is what it looks like. So I set this up on this like 11 year old and you can see I had him just kind of drop to a sidearm position. And this gives you like the live data, like every throw. Here's his arm slot. Here's the arm speed, the RPMs, and how much maximal external rotation he has. And then off that, it gives you kind of an arm stress number um, based on that research that they did, all the data they gathered. So on the far side, you saw him drop it, and you can see arm slot went down to 15, and it throws a little red flag up at you, say, in too low. The great thing about this, the, the, this app is it's free, um, but the coaches can use it. So a coach can have all his throwers, athletes, on his, um, on his app and monitor how many throws the guys are doing. So in the pros, these guys are wearing these every single time they throw. And the feedback I've heard from the pro guys is it's kind of sweaty. It's only like, it's only downfall. It gets pretty, pretty gnarly there, but um, it will pull out a calendar of the, of the month and it will show you how many stressful throws on what day you did. So it can kind of generate a throwing plan for them. Like, okay, on Tuesday I had, you know, 12 out of my 50 throws were stressful. So it kind of gathers, it kind of keeps that input. And then as you go through on, throughout the day, it will say, okay, on Saturday, what should I do? Well, it will give a recommendation of the intensity that you should have. And then if you have too many stress throws, it will kind of help monitor that. So it's, a, it's been a really cool app, and it is somewhat affordable. I think it, uh, the chip itself is, is 150, and you can also use that same chip for hitting. So it's kind of fun. They can get a bunch of data on their, on their hitting. This is a great resource that we use for the, for the families, the parents, athletes. Our, co our coaches probably need to do a little bit more job of looking at this stuff. But this is pitchsmart.org, pitchsmart.org. And it's a very easy website to um, navigate. This is Dr. Andrews and ASMI guys who really developed this early on with the Little League stuff, and they've moved into it. But you can go in and click on the guidelines. It lists a lot of those ones I mentioned on my first slide. So you can share that data with your athletes and your coaches. Um, risk factors, similar thing. And then it will give you, here's the days of rest thing I was referencing. So you can look all the way up to age seven to eight, all the way down to your 22, your collegiate athletes. This is the maximum pitches that they should pitch in a game. And then it says if they were at one, one to 20 down here or 30 in our older ones, they don't need a day of rest. But as you move up that scale, the more numbers they throw, the more required days of rest. And this is just numbers they came up with. This is the great thing about it is it's all by, based on research. And that's it. Thank you.